Hey, everybody. Welcome to the 10K Project. We are the largest community of investors who actively fund Black-owned businesses. And today I'm here with Ioni. She is the author of The Baby Billionaire's Guide to Investing. She's very much into how we as people, especially our young people, can get into investing, stock market, understanding the basic rules of money, things like that. So welcome. Thank you. Hello. So tell us a little bit about yourself and how you uh, became an expert on helping people actually get young people get into investing. Sure. Um, I started investing uh, when I was in elementary school um, by being with my mom, going to um, different financial and investing workshops. And I, I always start the story there, but I have to start a little bit before that. Um, I grew up with, in my grandmother's house. Uh, at the time, my parents were getting a divorce. And because of not knowing, uh, we ended up losing my grandparents' house. Um, oh. You know, not, not knowing uh, that you needed to, how to pass down wealth. Mm -hmm. And um, consequently, that opened my mom's eyes up to what she did not know. And at the time she was an entrepreneur, but she was an entrepreneur that didn't know what a will was, didn't know what a trust was, uh, didn't know what investing was. And mm -hmm. so that really set her on a path to uh, self-educating about money and investing and wealth building. And uh, similar to you know being taken to church, not having a choice, I was taken to these classes and um, and I also knew what was going on because my mom was always very transparent with me. And so, um, you know, as we make decisions as kids, we always make decisions, you know, um, mm -hmm. based on what we're exposed to, we'll say, oh, I want to end up like that. I want to be like this person, or I don't want to end up like that. And so that's what I said to myself. I don't want to end up like my mom. And so I started paying attention and, um, and just by paying attention and attending uh, the classes, uh, that's how we got introduced to Better Investing, which is a national nonprofit focused on investment education. Uh, been around for about 72 years now. Um, a lot of people will come up to me and be very encouraging about, oh, if I had only started when I was your age, you know, you're getting a head start. And so I knew that uh, even though I was still learning this stuff and I had a lot of questions, um, just based on the, that constant stream of comments and encouragement, I knew that I had to start early because if, you know, people that's able to retire early at 50 who started investing at 20 is coming to me, you know, seven, eight, nine, 10, 12 years old saying, oh, if I had only started at your age, the one takeaway is well, I have an advantage that they didn't have, right? right. And so um, just from there, I started at the time, this is before the internet. <clears throat> so um, Better Investing had a low cost uh, investment program where they had a partnership with a lot of uh, Fortune 500 investor relations departments. And so, you know, way before you could buy fractional shares, um, and way before uh, no commission brokerage accounts, there were um, a lot of high minimums. Like if you didn't have $10,000, you couldn't have a conversation with a broker. Uh, even rich widow white women um, who inherited wealth, sometimes people would not work with them. Just a lot of uh, discrimination in the field and mm -hmm. um, better investing allowed for people to start with purchasing just one share of stock directly from the company. And so um, there were stocks that I bought like Kellogg, uh, General Mills, um, Wendy's, CVS. And I just started with one share, you know, literally mm -hmm. filling out a check, mailing in um, the one page and mailing it in. And then, you know, I'm starting to get quarterly statements and then I'm starting to get annual reports. And so just little by little as a child, being able to you know, vote on corporate boards before you can vote in US elections uh, was very impactful to me. And um, 
Better investing made it very easy for me to understand the fundamentals of investing. And uh, once I understood it, my mom was always asking me for help. If she mm-hmm. was in an investment club, she was asking me, you know, can you show me this? Can you, you know, uh, help me in my investment club? Can you present this? And so just by learning and presenting, I then start teaching. So I've been teaching investing since about 12. And then I guess I'm just doing the same thing now, about 20 years later. That's fantastic. Uh, it's funny that you mentioned how they wouldn't, you know, let you in unless you had a sizable amount of money. I remember uh, being 23, maximum 24 years old, and this was back in the late 90s. Um, and I spoke with a woman, she was a Black woman, who worked for, I want to say it was Morgan Stanley at the time, mm-hmm. it was one of those mm-hmm. big companies. And she looked me straight up and she said, if you don't have $2 million to invest, I don't work with you. Exactly. And I remember thinking, wow, okay. Mm-hmm. You know, so what you're saying, like I even experienced that, not that I was really looking to work with her, but I thought it was, you mm-hmm. know, just very interesting. Um, but we're starting to see the democratization mm-hmm. of not only getting into uh, stock investing and and all sorts of other types of investing, but being able to getting into it uh, more easily from the, mm-hmm. the palm of your um, mm-hmm. your iPad or mm-hmm. your iPhone or, or um, your smartphone, right? Mm-hmm. So um, tell us, like, you, you talked a little bit about some of the first shares that you bought. Were mm-hmm. you investing in other things besides uh, stocks or, or were you just focused on stock investing when you were younger? Um, so I knew, you know, just in my education, I learned what a stock was. I learned what a bond was. I learned what a mutual fund was. Um, I knew what real estate investing was, but, you know, if you talk to a kid with 20 or $30, I mean, mm-hmm. you know, um, that, that necessarily wasn't on my radar and now I, I wasn't mm-hmm. attending real estate investing classes. So I think, mm-hmm. Uh, exposure is everything, you Mm -hmm. know, and that's why I'm fundamentally a stock investor because that's where my education led. Um, at the time, well, before you ask that, Uh um, I went to, my mom and I attended a church in Miami, a Newburgh Baptist church. And at the time when I, I'm going to say about nine or so, the church was raising money to build a new church Mm -hmm. and the process of raising money was issuing bonds Mm -hmm. and you know making those bonds available for purchase to church members and so Mm -hmm. um i knew what a bond was but in support of the church i um was like you know i'm gonna buy a bond and i'm gonna you know you learn through experience, I'm going to experience what this growth is compared to stock growth. And mm-hmm. from then I was like, oh, I'm never doing bonds again. I said that <laughs> like in middle school because the growth was just so slow and, yeah. you know, it became this whole thing. So uh, to answer your question, it really stock investing. And, and I have within the past month, I have come back to bonds. Um, I listen to a lot of financial podcasts. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, not a lot, but a few that I really like. Mm-hmm. Um, because I, I like to listen to people that are asking questions and coming up and sharing information, you know, which is a, 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 um, one of the reasons why I joined your organization last year. Um, and I came across iBonds. And again, because I know the fundamentals of it, what interest rate is, um, I just recently, I think, now I think, but it's probably been 25 years since I touched a, another bond, but uh, I just recently pur- purchased some I bonds um, because of the historic uh, inflation rates and interest rates that are being offered uh, right now. So um, I hope that answers the question. Yeah. So my follow-up question is um, with young people, let's say somebody mm-hmm. has a child, <laughs> Um, what is the earliest age that they could start? And, 
do you suggest that parents kind of have them focus like you did, just focus on stock investing or just focus on real estate investing and kind of get deep with that? Or do you suggest that parents try to introduce them to all sorts of investing, let them try a little bit of everything and then see what they gravitate to? That's a great question. Well, to, to uh, take a step-by-step, step, number one, you can own stock as soon as you have a social security number. So, Ooh, okay. Yeah. So uh, my brother just had a baby in November and I went mm -hmm. to visit them in March and I told them that I was going to open up and fund a Roth IRA mm -hmm. uh, for the baby. But when I visit, not visited in February. When I visited in February, they still hadn't had the social security number. Oh. So, um, you know, best laid plans of mice and men, but you know, um, yes, as soon as you have, and as long as you have a social security number, uh, you can purchase stock without a problem. There is no age mm -hmm. limit. Uh, that's one. Two, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna phrase it this way because I think this is actually more, more important, the, the approach to sharing with youth. Um, my mom, a lot of people know my mom because she's a successful entrepreneur and sometimes they will approach me and say, your mom did a great job because they're under the assumption that my mom taught me investing. And I like to um, remind parents not to feel the burden that you have to know in order to teach. Mm -hmm. um, my mother did not teach me investing. My mother took me to the spaces that was teaching investing. Mm -hmm. and, um, and when you can kind of move out of the way, just like you know, in the 90s, our parents was not teaching us technology. They brought mm -hmm. a computer home or they sent us to school. The school sat us in a computer lab and we learned it. But when it comes to money, there's a lot of guilt, shame, you know, this, un to me, unreasonable sense of responsibility when really you could probably just move out of the way and, mm -hmm. you know, put your child in those spaces that you're also sitting, you know, sitting in or at least trust enough and they're going to learn. Mm -hmm. um, so the the what of investing, I don't think is that important um, because the most important thing, the most to me, one of the most important concepts of being an entrepreneur and being an investor is opening your mind, especially a child's mind, to there are other ways to make money and create a living. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, as Black folk, that exposure is, is enough in and of itself. You know, I was just listening. My friend sent me a podcast um, with Stacey Abrams. Uh, mm -hmm. She was a guest on, I think, The Daily Stoic. And I'm listening to it right before, you know, you and I started talking. And she's like, you know, growing up, both of my parents were United Methodist ministers. And they always did outside things, entrepreneurial things to make ends meet. Mm -hmm. So in my mind, I never thought about you should be trying to be an entrepreneur. Most people that were being entrepreneurs is because they could not get a salary job. They were hustling. Yeah. Yeah. And it was because you couldn't, get, because your pay, your regular paycheck couldn't make ends meet. So you have to do this extra thing. And so, you know, being exposed to, ownership in various forms, whether it be entrepreneurship, stock ownership, real estate investing, just the concept of ownership, I think is, um, you know, what's most fundamental to expose kids to. Mm -hmm. um, and then from there, a lot of other things blossom. You start to understand money. You start to understand the relationship between being the borrower, being the lender, what is interest, you know, what happens when, you know, you borrow somebody's money, you don't pay them back on time, consequences. I mean, to me, all of those are lessons that can be learned um, out of that. And they're, you know, they're just kind of fundamental lessons um, that can be tied into how to make more money, the power of ownership, the freedom that that brings, the responsibility that that brings. Yeah. 
you, you, your discussion had me thinking really about the fact that um, in today's social media, we see people who have a lot of flash and we think they have a lot of cash, right? Mm. Um, our young people especially think if they don't see bling bling, um, I don't know all the, the verbiage, but y'all know what bling I'm talking is, about, that, yeah, that, still works. that person doesn't have any money. And I personally have talked about the one of the richest men I know has a Mickey Mouse watch on, but he's got a $50 million real estate portfolio, right? <laughs> so um, if parents are not sure like who to even put their children in the midst of mm. to begin <laughs> to teach these concepts. How does a parent, because I love what you said about parents, you you don't have to have the burden of knowing everything and imparting it on your kids. Put your kids in the environment where they can learn. But we, because there's so many scam artists out there, we want our kids to be in the right environment, safety, safety uh, mm -hmm. physically, safety mm -hmm. mentally, healthy mm -hmm. spaces and, and spaces that are teaching them properly. So my question to you is, how does a person vet these spaces to even make sure that, hey, yeah, I wanna put my 12 year old here, my 10 year old here, and know that they're going to be taken care of it's, it, in terms of the knowledge that they're getting? Yeah, what I would say is, um, again, trial and error, word of mouth, referrals. Mm -hmm. And let's say you don't like people. There are books. Go to the public library. Mm -hmm. You know, browse the business and the money section. Mm -hmm. um, one fundamental thing, and I, I, again, when I talk to parents who um, want to expose their kids to investing, I say to them, you know, one of, my mom had me reading a lot of different books um, growing up, but one I remember specifically, and this is something where we would turn the radio off. We didn't really listen to radio in the car anyway, but she was having me read um, Smart Women Finish Rich by David Bach aloud in the car, right? So an activity of reading aloud, vocal projection, reading comprehension, and learning about money, all in that one instance of, if she's reading a book, it's okay for me to read the book, and I'm actually reading it aloud for her in the car like you would an audio book. I like you know? that. Yeah, I mean, I like it, let's just yeah. keep it simple. I mean, and then yeah. once you expose yourself to that information, you're going to come into come into contact with more resources, you know, websites. Amazon will give you a whole bunch. Of you know, and then I think too. Well, this is something somebody said on TV yesterday. Well, actually, no, today. Um, but I think too. Sometimes we underestimate what our children learn from us. Mm -hmm. You know, and what we're exposing them to. And more often than not, they're gonna have our mindset if we're not um, changing ourselves and mm -hmm. open about that change or at least exposing them to alternative lifestyles. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, going back to your question about um, not feeling like a person is rich unless they have bling bling, I mean, that's very evident for adults. If you're not driving a Mercedes or you're not driving a Lexus, what is your initial response of that person? It's if they're driving a Toyota Corolla, you know what I mean? And they have shoes with a, without a logo, how are you responding to that person? How are you mm -hmm. treating them? Mm -hmm. And so children really just grow up to be like us. And um, sometimes it's hard to want better for your child than you want for yourself mm -hmm. because you know your child looks up to you and mm -hmm. if you're not willing to do it if you're not willing to learn and grow and ask questions and uh be humbled sometimes because you don't know you know yeah. um yeah it's it as much as you may want it for your child it's going to be very hard for them because we learn by we we learn most by seeing and then doing, not yeah. by talking. Yeah. 
Well, I know personally, because I've seen a lot of profit and loss statements and a lot of balance sheets of a lot of business owners because of um, my mother's bookkeeping business that the mm. flashiest people are always the brokest. If I said 99.9% cent, .9 I'd be 0.1% off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I, uh, actually, there's only one person I know who, who was flashy and, and who... Um, who had actually enough had money, to, to but finance. but the rest of them, is the, yeah, like you 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 see the person come into the office, you oh, you look great, and you're looking at their, their balance sheet, and you're like, oh, don't look so good. So, um, you know, so what you're saying, I, is, I also know personally, I um, I like to not discuss. I like to discover people when they're just getting started on their teaching journey. Mm. Um, you know, before they get a million subscribers and super successful, because people, especially on social media, again, they will flex in order to get to that million. But when they're just starting out with 600 followers, mm -hmm. um, you know, 1500 followers, it's uh, even 6000 followers, they tend to be, uh, they tend to give a lot more. And they tend to be just um, the, the uh, tips, tend to be a lot more accessible and doable mm. and things like that. So that's just a personal thing for me. Mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. um, uh, so a couple of final questions for you. Um, mm -hmm. With regards to some of the uh, investing terms that mm -hmm. young people should know, like if, if we had a, a basic money 101 where you're telling parents like, Make sure before your kids leave the house that they know these three, four or five terms, what they mean and how it applies to their life. What would you say? Great question. Whew. Um, I have one and two. Let me think about three. I think three may come, but maybe we just do two. Okay. We can do the, two. Very, the very first one is interest. And in interest, there is simple interest and there is compound interest. And I think that it's, I'm drinking water. And it's very similar to when I learned, there's this book called <clears throat> Your, Body, Your Body's Many Cries for Water, right? Once you understand, at least to me, once you understand the role that water plays in your life, how powerful it is in terms of drinking it, drinking enough of it, everything else tends to work itself out. You know, your skin becomes clear, your sleep is better, your joints work when you need them, you know, your bowels go like, but when you don't have water, there's a lot of dysfunction, right? And then you're trying to cover it up with, I need to go to the hospital. I need to go to the doctor. I need this face cream. I need this shea butter. I need that. I need, you know, and that's to me what interest is. Once I learned what interest was, everything else became clear. Everything else became a sum of opportunity costs. If I have, as an eight-year-old child, if I have $1 sitting in a bank account, how much interest is the bank paying me? If I have uh, that less same, than 1%. <laughs> right. If I have that same dollar sitting in an energy stock, the same energy company that my parents pay their energy bill to every month, how much interest am I making in the form of dividends, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Just when I understood that, it was like, why would I even have that much money in at the bank anyway? Mm -hmm. Like just understanding interest. And I listened to um, two of my favorite um, financial podcasts is Afford Anything. And I will teach you to be rich with mm -hmm. Rami Sethi. I know that one. Yeah, and Rami will have these couples on and people do not know 
the real interest rate that they are being charged and the implication of having a balance. For example, if I have a credit card and I have a $1,000 balance and my APR rate is 23%, most people, when they think that they're going to pay that credit card off, it's like, oh, it's $1,000. And if I can make $100 payments, I'm going to pay that thing off in 10 months. $1,000 on a credit card is not static like that. But to me, it's because you don't understand how interest works. Because if you understood how interest work, work you would know that it's not $1,000 even by next month, right? So the first concept is interest and compound interest. Because once you understand that, all of your money decisions and actions will make sense. You know, when people feel like, oh, I'm paying off this student loan or this credit card bill and I don't feel like I'm making any movement. Yeah, that's because you don't understand how interest works. It's like quicksand, but you don't understand how interest works. Like, yeah. you and waited too long. One? You know, what'd you say? I said, what's the second one? Yeah, the second, the second the one, second one is um, PE ratio. If you're going to be investing, you should know what a PE ratio is. So very much like interest. A lot of people, especially now that they're investing, are focused solely on the price of a stock. And when we go shopping, we never look solely at the price of anything. If I was going to buy a dress at Walmart, I would look at the price of that dress in comparison to the number of wares, right? If I'm gonna get, you know, a more expensive Gucci shirt or Ann Taylor shirt, whatever it is, I'm looking at the price divided by the number of wares or the price divided by the number of use. And in, in um, uh, well, it's not, I'm gonna say overrated, um, but the stock market has been overvalued. That's the word I'm looking for. Very overvalued as of late. Um, if you knew that it was overvalued, the last four months of the stock market going down would not surprise you. Why? Because, you know, 2020, 2021 record highs have made many companies have record PE ratios. What is a PE ratio? P-E ratio is the price divided by the earnings per share. So if I'm going to own one share of um, ownership in a company, I'm going to look at what is my earnings per share in return, right? Um, many people don't know to look for it. They're investing in companies that, that aren't making any money, right? So that means you're buying a business that is negative. Um, you know, when we go shopping, we always want to be in a certain reasonable, you know, I'm willing to pay more because this is going to last me two, three, five years, right, this garment. And so that's the same type of mindset mentality we should have when we're investing. You want to pay for something that is actually making you money, and you wanna make sure that the relationship between the price of that thing and the earnings or profit per share of that thing is reasonable. Um, so those are the two, that's, those are the two. Great, I mean, I think that just understanding those two things and I know that you have uh, several other things within your book. Why don't, you, why don't you tell people a little bit more about how to get in touch with you, how to follow you on social media? Sure. Um, I'm not really on social media, but you can follow okay. Better Investing. So at Better Investing um, on Instagram, on Twitter, um, Better Investing South Florida Chapter uh, Facebook group. Um, my name is spelled I-O-N-N-I-E. My number is 561-352-4967, 561-352-4967. And my email address is uh, Ioni, I-O-N-N-I-E, 
McNeil, M-C-N-E-I-L-L at yahoo.com. Perfect. And we're going to put it in the description box of, um, of the YouTube video as well for everybody. So you all can get Ioni's information there. Well, thank you so much. We do encourage uh, people to reach out to Ioni if you have young ones. And uh, we all should focus on getting them started early. So taking the information that Ioni gave us today and being able to implement it for our kids and our grandkids. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Okay.